know about that, that, that makes you, you know, have to look much harder to find out, but it also gets back to passenger rights that you have to basically do yourself. There was, a, there was an old rule that done by the CAB, the old Civil Aeronautics Board rule called Rule 240. And Rule 240, by the way, it's still around, but they, they renamed it, it's called Rule 12020. But they all know it generically as 240. I'll give you an example. If an airline cancels your flight for any reason whatsoever other than weather, and you go up to the gate agent and say, 240 me, they will look at you like deer in the headlights for about 30 seconds and then realize, oh my God, he knows. What 240 says is, they have the right at that point, and so do you, to have them, assuming there's space available, that, that, that to endorse Washington, your so ticket just... over to the next available flight on any carrier which they have an agreement, and then off you go. Right? So, I was on a flight from, I was supposed to be on a flight from New Orleans to, to LaGuardia. I got to the, to the counter and it canceled, and I said 240 me. And they looked at me like the, you know, the scene from Ferris Bueller. Oh no. And they had to rewrite the ticket, and I took everybody online with me because they didn't know about 240. And off we went to New York on another airline. We went on Delta. Point is, you need to know that, and they don't tell you that, right? No one's going to volunteer that for you. We just did. Well, can I be the first person to ask a question here? How do you know which airlines have interline agreements with which other airlines? I've asked and asked. I've asked this is nowhere. The answer is in the baggage. I'll explain. Let's say you're going from Los Angeles to New York through, through Dallas, but you're flying LA to Dallas on American and Dallas to New York on Delta, right? In the old days, you could check your bags all the way through. Today, no, because Delta and American no longer have that interline agreement. But Delta has it with United, and United might have it with American. You just, all you have to do to find out who's got the interline agreement is saying, can I check my bags all the way through? And if they say no, you know they don't have the agreement with that airline. Delta and American actually restored it. Are you kidding not. No, they actually restored their interline agreement. Delta had gotten uh, a little bit greedy, look, our operation that was more reliable than Americans. We, you know, you have all these passengers that are getting canceled uh, back in 2018. We want to charge you more than the industry standard. Americans said no. Um, and then their operation got a little better. Delta wasn't quite as good as it used to be. Delta came back and said, no, we'll do the industry standard deal with you. Uh, and okay, so, so now the that. answer is you, you will get that ticket rewritten. I think one of the useful things to know if you're just a little confused about all these interline agreements is that one thing is for sure, which is the low cost airlines have fewer interline agreements. As in none. Oh, as in none. So, so if you're on Southwest Airlines and you're connected to another flight, you gotta go get your bags, Go back to security and check in again. One right? of the things that comes up again and again in people that write in to me is they think that low-cost airlines are just, they just cost less or the seats just have less space. But there's all this stuff behind the scenes that is also maybe sometimes worse. Customer service is not always as good. Not that it's so great on the main airlines either. Um, well, wait a second. Let's discuss customer service. Okay. The oxymoron of all oxymorons next to airline food. Another oxymoron. But let's discuss customer service. What did American Airlines just do last week? They laid off 600 people in customer service in Dallas and Phoenix and then put out a press release that said what, Gary? That it was in order to improve customer service. <laughs> <laughs> I'd like to see that connected. Uh, Frontier Airlines got rid of it entirely. Well, they, what they did is they eliminated their telephone customer service so that you couldn't call them. Yeah, God forbid you could have a conversation with somebody. But you know what? Having said all that, there are other things you can do. My rule of thumb is, you never take a no from someone who's not empowered to give you a yes in the first place. So, it's the way you do it. So, the very first person you get on the phone is usually only empowered to tell you no. Or the very first person you encounter at the airport is only empowered to tell you no. Find the one person who can give you a yes, be very nice, this is not Battle of the Network Stars, and then, if they tell you no, it really is a no. But they are also empowered to give you a yes. That makes all the difference in the world. I mean, it's true. Sure, I've heard people also say if you call once, call again, maybe you'll get someone else that will give you a yes. By the way, speaking of calling, how many people have been put on hold? <laughs> how many people are still waiting? <laughs> well, here's, the, here's my secret uh, way to do it. You don't call the 800 number for the airline you want to talk to in this country. 
you call the 800 number of the same airline in another country. Meaning, you call the 800 number for American in, uh, you know, in Dubai, or the, the 800 number for United Airlines in London. They're awake, they're seeing the same thing on their computer screen that the same guys are seeing in Raleigh, Durham, or Dallas, or Chicago, and you won't be waiting for seven hours for an answer back, and you might even, now, if you get somebody on the phone who doesn't know the difference between, you know, Dulles and Dallas, then you can hang up and call again. Yeah, I mean, that is when you need something urgently. Uh, I'm curious how you all feel. When something is not quite as urgent, I always recommend doing everything in writing. If you can get the email address of someone, this might be after the fact when you're trying to get your, some money back for something, always email or chat and screenshot everything. Because when you talk to someone on the phone, they say a lot of things that end up not necessarily being true. And unless you record the conversation yourself, you know how they say, this call will be recorded to improve customer service. You can't get your hands on that recording. I have tried again and again to, when people uh, with airlines to get them to send me a recording of customer service. They just won't do it. So anything you can get in writing or record yourself, I really recommend that you do it. And the funniest thing ever, this is my demented sense of humor, is after you've been holding for seven hours and you finally think you're about to get connected, they'll say, please stay on the line after our call for a two-minute survey on our customer service. <laughs> no, we already know the survey. You suck. <laughs> so bottom line is you got to get to somebody, a human being, and if you can circumvent it and go through another location and get it, please do that. Uh, I want to go through another topic very quickly because it's in the news as of yesterday, and that is how many people here read State Department advisories? How many people know what they are? Okay. Well, for those of you who don't, I'm going to give you a quick little history. State Department advisories have been around for a long time. And you may have seen in the news over the last 48 hours, it says State Department warns travelers. No, those are not warnings. Those were advisories. But where did advisory start? About 30 or 40 years ago. But then they changed. First of all, they were never applied equally, right? While they were telling everybody not to go to the Middle East, Ireland was getting blown up, and there was never an advisory, right? It was done in a very selective way. And then something happened. December 21st, 1988. Anybody remember that day? I do. Lockerbie, Pan Am 103, one of the great tragedies in aviation. Well, five days before that bombing, the U.S. Embassy in Helsinki received very credible information that a U.S. flag carrier was going to be blown up over Christmas coming out of London. And what did they do with that information? And it was very credible. They only told other State Department personnel. So that plane with 259 people on board, those people never had a chance. They all died, 11 people on the ground. Well, once that information surfaced about that information that had come out of the, of the embassy in Helsinki, the State Department went nuts. The needle just shifted over. And from that moment on, if an American tore a hangnail in Peru, they issued a State Department advisory, right? It, everything was about fear-based, and it was CYA. That's a technical term if anybody wants me to interpret that. <laughs> Has anybody read the, t the State Department advisory for Turkey? Let me give it to you. Americans are advised that Turkish drivers pass on the left and the right. <laughs> Have they been on the 405? Is that going to stop me from going to Turkey? But you heard the three words State Department advisory, you don't go. State Department advisory for Indonesia. Americans are warned to stay away from buses and avoid large crowds. I live in LA. I avoid buses because I have no idea where they go. <laughs> That's terrorism. I know if I get on a bus in LA, I will never come back. I just don't know where they go. But and all kidding aside, those State Department advisors were, even with the best of intentions, misleading and full of bad information. So now let's cut to what happened two and a half years ago in the Trump administration. They realized this was not working, so they decided to go the other way. And they've now issued a State Department advisory for every one of the 196 countries. And they've done it in four levels. Let me walk you through the levels, and then we'll talk to you about what just happened this week in the Bahamas and Jamaica, right? Level one says travel with normal caution. What the hell does that mean? To me, travel with normal caution means don't trip and fall, right? Level two, travel with increased caution. Ooh, that means you're putting plywood on your windows. Level three means reconsider travel. Now you're in the basement in the safe room. 
And level four, which by the way is only an advisory, three words, do not travel. So what just happened this week? The Bahamas went to a level two, travel with increased caution. Why? Because the murder rate in the Bahamas just soared in the first month of this year in January, and a lot of street crime. Most Americans never leave their resorts. Most Americans never leave the hotels. And who's doing the street crime and the murders? It's gangs against gangs, very much like Mexico, right? 65,000 people have been killed in Mexico over the last 14 years. How many Americans? Anybody want to guess? 11. And of the 11, nine were vacationing drug dealers. Is that going to stop me from going to Mexico? No. But the fear-based attitude is you hear those three words, State Department advise you, I'm not going to go. Jamaica this week went to a level three. And the level three is reconsider travel. Why? Again, street crime, gangs, homicides, but not at the resorts. So you need to not only read these State Department advisories completely, but don't just stop there. Go to the British Foreign Office. You're, you're nodding because you know. I was about to say that. Say it. Well, go to the British one. Go to the Australian one. Just don't read their warnings about the United States, of course. And by the way, the Brit I happen to think the British Foreign Office does a better job of telling their citizens what's going on with real-time information. Well, one thing that is just, you have to remember is that a country, imagine a, a warning about the United States about, uh, I don't know, a hurricane in Florida and you put off your trip to Alaska. A lot of times we think of other countries just as like one monolithic place. Um, I remember when there was, um, the nuclear incident in, in Japan, the tsunami and nuclear incident, Fukushima. half of Japan was still open for business. And you would have thought, I mean, we absolutely, even my editor made me cancel my trip to Japan, even though I said, why don't I just go to the other half of Japan? The Japanese tourism folks were begging me to come, right. but we just think it's just one country. So sometimes now the State Department, in the Mexican warning by the State Department does distinguish between regions of the country. But if you read something that's very general overall about a big country that you're going to, look into it further. But by the way, they were forced <laughs> to, to specify the regions wow. of the country when I went on the air and said how stupid the warnings were because the two regions that they're now warning you about are Ciudad Juarez and Nuevo Laredo. There is nobody here vacationing in Ciudad Juarez or Nuevo Laredo unless you're a vacationing uh, drug dealer. So you, the other thing I would suggest that you do and now both, both Bahamas and, and Jamaica, of course, speak English, but no matter where you're going, there are English language newspapers published there. Go online, read the last two weeks of those papers, and now you can make an informed decision as to whether or not you really want to go. Informed, I mean, look, travel volumes dropped to Kona after the Maui wildfires. Oh, yes. <laughs> all, the other, all the other neighbor islands were suffering because everybody said you couldn't go to Hawaii. By the way, other than West Maui, you can still go to Maui. The only thing that's nailed is Lahaina, and that rebuilding effort's gonna take about four years. Let's not kill our, kid ourselves. But for the rest of Maui, we went over there and reported on it, and as John said at the beginning, I'm a fireman in New York, so if I went in with the fire guys to get a really first-hand ex experience on how bad the damage was and how bad the rebuilding was gonna be in terms of time. So you're not going to be going to Lahaina, but the rest of Maui is open for business, and this is the one time they absolutely need you to come because the, the economy of Hawaii depends 80% on travel and tourism. There are so many, it's actually a great idea to, you can really support countries, whatever country is in the news because of a disaster, wait a month, wait two months and go there because people stop going, sometimes for decades. I meet so many people like, I would never go to Colombia because they grew up in the 1980s when Colombian drug Pablo lords Escobar. were on the news. Well, guess what? I mean, it's not the 1980s anymore. And by the way, the Pablo Escobar good. died in 1993. Right. So yeah. just remember, especially those of us that are getting older, don't think about what was on the news 20 years ago and judge a country because of that. Same thing's happening now in the Middle East because of what's going on in Gaza. If you want to go down the Nile right now, now's the time to do it. Absolutely. I mean, Egypt is not affected by this. Jordan is not affected by this. They happen to be close to it, but nobody's firing rockets into Jordan. People, this is something many, many people wrote to me about. They wanted their money back for a Nile cruise because of the war. And okay, at least that's bordering Egypt. At least I can understand it sort of uh, logically speaking, even though it's, there was nothing more dangerous about going 
down the Nile, I got a bunch of stuff from people who didn't want to go to Morocco anymore. So I actually looked up the State Department level. Morocco was at a level two, which was the same as Belgium. I said, well, unless you're not going to Belgium, you can definitely go to Morocco. Exactly. By the way, speaking of cruises, how many people here take cruises? How many people have taken more than one? So your fans. Okay, how do you pay for your cruises? There are a lot of people here exhibiting today, cruise lines, right? How many people want deposits up front? How do you pay for it? Most of you paid with a credit card, yes? Is that my right? Yes? Okay, but what are your rights? What are your rights when somebody wants a deposit way ahead, you pay with a credit card, and either you don't get the service you want, or the, or the cruise gets canceled, you want your money back, or you want to change, what are your rights? And that's a very big gray area because under federal credit law, if I buy a service or a good today, I have 60 days in which to dispute the charge if I didn't receive the good or the service. But what about the travel operators who are asking for deposits six months in advance? <clears throat> what, is, what, is, what are your rights then? It's even more, a little more complicated than that. It's now it's 60 days from the statement close date in which you made the charge, but in uh, one federal circuit, uh, it actually only applies if you haven't paid off in full the charge. So you act, they, on the other hand, um, as a general practical matter, the bank may do more. The networks can charge back up to 18 months. So it really is, it, the answer is it depends. So and it, individual credit cards have their own internal rules that go way beyond the federal credit laws, which actually benefit you, and nobody knows it. You need to remind your own credit card issuer, whether it's Visa, MasterCard, or American Express, and nine times out of 10, unless it's a truly extraordinary circumstance, you'll get your money back. But wait a minute. What about the cruise that we've all read about, which you've covered, I've covered, all the people who decided they were gonna give up their jobs, <laughs> give up their livelihood, and sail away for three years on a cruise that did not exist, and they put all their money down. And many of these people lost thirty and $40,000. What's going on with that, Seth? I'm gonna turn it back to you. I'm not sure what's going on. I'll tell you what's going on. What's going on right now is it's now they're facing criminal charges because it's fraud. They, they sold a ship that didn't exist. And people just, and then by the way, the ship was supposed to sail from Istanbul. So people flew over to Istanbul to meet a ship that never showed up, and they're all out the money. So this brings up one big, very important topic that every state is now dealing with, right? Some better than others. It's a six-letter word that you all know, escrow. You can't buy a house without putting the money in escrow. You shouldn't buy travel without putting the money in escrow. And a reputable tour operator or travel provider in many states now is required to do that. For example, if you buy that cruise six months from now, right, and you pay with a credit card, right, that money in many cases does not go to the cruise line. It goes into an escrow account monitored by a third party, and the only time that cruise line gets the money is when you get foot, set foot on the ship and the ship leaves the harbor. Now, that can bankrupt some companies who are not properly capitalized as well it should. Otherwise, they're using your money to pay for your cruise and your money to pay for your cruise. So you are within your rights to tell your travel agent or your travel provider, is there a third party escrow provision here when I make my deposit? Because if they say no, you know what? You're at risk. Airline you, charters have to do that at the federal level. Yes. So um, a commercial airline does not. An airline, a major airline, can have a fair sale to generate cash that they'll spend now for all the flights in three and six months. But a charter operator is required to hold the funds in escrow until the flight occurs. Now, there have been cases where the operator didn't do that. They've gotten in trouble when the money, you're still out the money. Sure. And by the way, you know we see all the biggest scams? Next week, Super Bowl. They run ads saying, Fly to Las Vegas, we're gonna give you the hotel, we're gonna give you the airline tickets, and you're gonna watch the game. Yeah, you're gonna watch the game on a television set in your hotel room, which is not exactly next to the stadium. And so, you, once again, it's scamorama time. You need to get to the fine print and have those conversations, otherwise, you just wasted a lot of time. And this happens at every major event, it happens at the Olympics, it's coming up in Paris. Anybody here going to the Olympics in Paris? Good, because you'd be paying too much money. 
Hmm. Right now, a hotel room in Paris is $2,000 a night for the Olympics. They even increased the price for the Louvre. They doubled it. Uh, they increased the price of the Paris Metro. They doubled it, right? So you get to stand in an even longer line at the Louvre to come back two hours later to say, it's so small. <laughs> How many people did that? Come on, you did it. I know you did it. All right. And you stood in line, didn't you? Yeah. And you got in the back of the room and you, that's it? You did it, didn't you? Okay. I'm not telling you not to go to the Louvre. We're just trying to tell you how to go to the Louvre, right? Don't go in July, because that's when the Olympics are. But the bottom line go is... In July, go to the Louvre in the, the UAE. It'll be hot there. Go to the Louvre in the UAE. It'll be hotter there, <laughs> but you won't be standing in line. By the or way, go to the Louvre and don't bother seeing the Mona Lisa. There's so many other floors in the Louvre that are so much better, honestly. But here's the interesting thing about going to Paris. You guys get taxed for things you don't even know about. There's a UK tax for airline tickets for anybody leaving a UK airport. And that money does not go to where it's supposed to go anyway. You're being taxed without even being represented. And they tax you based not on the price you paid for your ticket, they tax you based on what the highest cost of that particular ticket class could be. So let's say you're on a frequent flyer ticket and you actually were able to redeem it for a business class ticket, your taxes are $800. So that wasn't really a free ticket. However, how many people here have heard of an open jaw ticket? Good, okay, then for those of you who haven't, if you want to go to Paris this summer or at any time of the year, here's what you do. You also want to go to London too? Great, you can fly from LA to London, then take the train to Paris and fly home from Paris, you avoid that tax. And for the $800 you save for not paying that tax, you have a hotel and a dinner in Paris. It works that way. And anytime you can do an open jaw ticket or look at the train routing systems in Europe now, especially with the Eurostar, because you can go from London to, to, to Brussels, to Amsterdam, to Paris in, in record time. And it makes a lot of sense. The whole idea here is not to get hosed in terms of that. Speaking of how not to get hosed, I'm going to turn it over to Seth on this one because I know he has something to say about this. The dreaded hotel resort fees. How many letters do you get on that? Um, well, I mean, I, I don't, actually, you know what, I don't get that many letters on the hotel resort fees because that, that's not the sort of, people don't feel they've been mistreated as sort of an individual. We're all just being mistreated as a group by these sort of phantom hotel resort fees. And I know what, what you would say, which is that just try to get out of them, try to refuse well, no, to but pay you, them. But, but you can get out of them. Does anybody know why there are hotel resort fees? The same reason why Frontier Airlines charges you only $20 for a ticket. It's about the taxes. An airline ticket is charged at a very high federal excise tax, so that a $100 ticket may only net the airline $48 or $52. The rest of it's going to taxes. But if Frontier Airlines charges you only $20 for the ticket, which they don't care how much that gets taxed, but $100 to breathe and $200 for bags and you know, $150 for a Diet Coke, those, are not, those aren't fares. Those are fees, and fees get taxed at the local sales tax or the state sales tax percentage of only 7%. So for a $100 fee, the airline's netting $93. It's as simple as that. Same thing with hotels. Every city has something called an occupancy tax. In some cities, it could be as high as 21%. So for a $200 room, the hotel's only netting to begin with 160 bucks because $40 goes to the municipality. So how do they try to make that up? with a stupid resort fee, right? How many people have ever willingly paid it? <laughs> willingly? That's why I'm standing here, sir. The choice that you have is to negotiate up front. You didn't. And the point is, everything at a hotel is negotiable. Hotels do not make money when you stay once. The hotels make money when you stay once, tell your friends and come again. And if enough of you say we're not going to do it, and by the way, oh, that, that number is growing, and it's also got the attention of state attorneys general around the United States. There have been class action suits. There have been state lawsuits against these companies. And there have been settlements already not letting them do that because they're not doing what? They're not properly disclosing it. It's failure to disclose. It's not transparent. And not only that, it's not what you bargained for, right? I stayed at a hotel in San Juan, and when I checked in, they gave me a coupon for a free drink. I said, what's this? And they said, oh, it's part of our resort package. I said, well, I don't drink. They said, but you could. And I said, oh, that's nice. I said, what else do I get? 
oh, a free yoga lesson. I said, let me see how this is gonna work out. I'm gonna be in the middle of a free yoga lesson doing downward dog and contemplating what the hell am I paying $48 a night for for this resort fee? You know what? They took it off the bill. I've never had a resort fee stayed on the bill, even when it says in many Las Vegas hotels, resort fee mandatory. By the way, 48 hours ago, they just raised the resort fee uh, at MGM without telling anybody another $6 a night. So, it's, so everybody's paying like $50 a night now, over and above what you thought your rate was. For what? A towel at the pool that you're not going to go to? So, look, there's been one settlement already with Marriott and the state attorneys general of the state of, of Nebraska and also the Washington District of Columbia. What it says now is that Marriott has to display the resort fee in the same type font, uh, typeface, and position as they display their fare or their room rate when you go online. Even so, that doesn't mean you have to pay it. It's all still negotiable. When do you negotiate it? Not online. There's nobody to talk to. You negotiate it when you check in or before you check in with an amazing invention called the telephone, where you make a call to, yes. Well, listen, they gave you something of value. The question was, the last, the last hotel he stayed at, parking was included in the resort fee. So if you didn't pay the resort fee, you got stuck with parking. At least they gave you something of value. <laughs> and that you could do the math. So do it that way. But for most people, a free cocktail and a yoga class was not really what you, what you bargained for. The, the, the problem with the resort fee isn't really the fee itself, the, the amount of money. I mean, there's a cost of the room, and if they advertise, here's the cost of the room, and you choose to pay it, that's fair, right? The problem with the resort fee is then they advertise a lower price than you are required to charge, uh, to, to pay. And what the um, Marriott initially with Pennsylvania and then with Texas, and we're starting to see some copycat, is a requirement that they will display the resort fee um, inclusive of, uh, with, the, with the room rate, on their own website. Now this only applies to their own booking channels. So if you call up Marriott, they'll give you a price that includes that uh, resort fee. But if you go to Expedia or to booking.com, you are going to be shown prices that do not include the resort fees. And the resort fees may differ. And you've got to click through to the end to see the price and they have to show it to you with the resort fee, but it makes comparisons of hotels really difficult. So you don't see what the total costs are when you're doing the comparison piece. And that's where the resort fee really becomes a problem. Now the, the tax piece of it, and it varies by jurisdiction, but even when the, the, the tax piece of it doesn't apply, I mean they're still benefiting from showing a rate that appears to be lower than competitors, right? Which is you know disingenuous, fraudulent. Uh, it's misleading of the consumer, and you know they are uh, so you're like you're you're paying more than you you, you think you're paying, right? But you know it's it, it's with with airlines it's really clear. This is why Spirit and Frontier have an extra fee to book on their website. It's an internet convenience fee, hmm. right? Emphasis it's, on the word convenience. Right. And the idea there is a fee for an airline has to be something that is optional. Right, and that's how they get around the tax issue. If it's non-optional, it has to be part of the fare. It has to be optional. So they, everyone's going to book online if you're Spirit and Frontier, but it, it, they'll charge you more. The optionality there that lets them get out of the taxes is you could go to the airport <laughs> and book a ticket at the ticket counter and not pay the web convenience fee. And like people do this, but you've got to park if you're driving, right? You pay for transportation, you stand in line, you've got to wait until they're not busy, and then they're like, oh, I have to figure out how to issue a ticket? And so it's time consuming, but it's technically optional. But at least there, there is a choice, right? If, it, if there's not a choice, then it is the rate, right? I've seen hotels that have had resort fees that include the television in the room. And I'm like, okay, Take the television out. I'm not going to watch it. Right? Use of the beach. Use of the beach. The feel of the sand. I get it. But by the way, they come up with different definitions. So many city hotels were charging a resort fee. What was that? 
So now they charge a destination fee or a hospitality fee. Some hotels have gone one step beyond, which is cruelly fraudulent, and they're charging something called a destination tax. There are no destination taxes. And, and so you need to fight that back. And by the way, we do it all the time. I'll give you an example of what happened to me. I was checking into a hotel in Phoenix, and I only had carry-on bag. I was there to give a speech. This is quite ironic. I was there to give a speech to the innkeepers of America, 400 people who own hotels. Right? I was speaking to them the next morning at 8.30. I checked in the night before at about 11.30. I, got, I gave my credit card to the front desk. They gave me my room key. I didn't need the bellman, but I saw him standing there. His name was Manny. He's going to come into the story later. I go back to my room. The next morning, the bill is under the door. The bill is for the room, the tax, and I had some room service. And then there was another charge. And the other charge was $10 mandatory tip to bellman. Huh. Mandatory tip to bellman. So it was still early in the morning. So I called downstairs, and Manny was still working. And I said, Manny, what is this? He says, yeah, I know. I said, just at least tell me you get the money. He said, no, I don't get any of it. I said, Manny, what are you doing at 8.30? He said, why? I said, you're my guest at the speech. And I brought him in to 450 hotel people who were staying for the next two days, so they hadn't seen their bill yet. And I held up the bill, and I told the story, and I had Manny explain what wasn't happening. And all of a sudden, there's a frantic hand waving in the back of the room. You know who that was? That was the general manager of the hotel. And I said, yes, sir. He said, oh, I'll be glad to take it off your bill. I said, you're not getting the point. You got to take it off everybody's bill. He said, well, I can't do that. So I said, okay, what are you doing at 8.30 tomorrow morning? He said, why? I said, I'm holding up this bill on the Today Show. And I did. And the Hilton Company went nuts because they clearly were trying to screw people with an additional charge that wasn't even going to the, to the person who you thought it was going to. So we all have rights here. I have a forum that maybe you don't have, but you have wallets and you get to vote with them. And if enough people do it, like, by the way, let me be clear about something. I don't deny any hotel, cruise line, airline, or tour operator the ability to make a decent profit in their business. I'm asking them to be clear, clear and transparent and honest about the way that they do it. I, I would Thank you. I would, yes, I agree. I, I would only add, I'm actually pretty happy that so many people are trying to, starting to fight against these resort fees. Yeah. They're, we as Americans are subject to all kinds of prices that don't end up being the final price in our daily lives. When you go to another country and you see something in the supermarket or in the store, that's the final price. Here we add taxes when we get to the register. <clears throat> when you eat at a restaurant, you have to add a tip at the end of all oh, that. Oh, it's more than just a tip. And Well, and a tax. And, and the health plan and all these other charges that you didn't know about. I had, a, I had a receipt the other night that went on for five lines before it even got to me to sign it. And nobody disclosed this at the time I looked at the menu. It's so the same the, deal. The and, fact and, that we tolerate any of this is, is just crazy. So at least it's nice that we're talking about it finally. And we've seen you know, tips at the self-checkout kiosks at the airport. You know, what do you want to add? And you think there, at least I can opt out. I found one in the Austin airport that did not accept zero. A wow. self-checkout kiosk. Take it one step further. There was research that came out this week now, you don't actually make the payment, but that if you offer ChatGPT a tip, you get longer, more accurate answers. <laughs> oh, this, that's scary. That's an entire separate seminar, everybody. But the bottom line here is you have power that you didn't think you had. You have power because it's a strength in numbers. More people are traveling now than ever before in the history of mankind. This year, 1.4 billion people will cross a border, and that doesn't even include the Chinese who are just starting to travel now. So this, it's more than 2019, and it's gonna just get bigger and bigger and bigger. But then it comes to the point of, can you afford it? Last year, last summer, do you know what the airfare was, round trip coach from LA to London? Coach, $2,100. Ridiculous, and the planes are full, right? Now, can they sustain that this year? Are you going to pay that this year? I mean, you're here, you want to travel, what are you going to do? Question is, how are you going to do it? And here's the biggest problem. So many people during the pandemic saved a lot of money. And they also made a decision about their purchasing pattern. It may not even been a conscious decision. But what came out of it was, you know what? 
I've gotten up close and personal with my own mortality. Either I got COVID and survived, or worse, friends and family got it and didn't. I feel a ticking clock. So you know what? I don't know how long I'm going to be on the planet. I'm not going to buy material goods. I don't care about a new car, new clothes, new jewelry, new electronic items. I want to buy experiences. And so everybody called it revenge travel. No, it wasn't revenge travel. It was refocused travel. And everybody came out of the gate crazy, and they weren't price sensitive. I want that room no matter how much it cost. I want that, that flight no matter how much. I got to go. I got to go. And they did. They blew through their savings. How many people here during the pandemic, and by the way, it's still going on, received solicitations in the mail from credit card companies offering you major bonus miles and points if you join the card, right? OK. A lot of people did that. The interest rate on those cards starts at 24%. Banks are legally allowed to go up to 35%. If I loaned you money at 24%, I'd go to jail. It's called usury, but the credit card companies are allowed to do it. What is the consumer credit card debt in this country right now? Anybody want to guess? It's $1.4 trillion. That's all unsecured credit. And only 54% of Americans pay their credit card bills in full every month. So that means you're never going to get ahead. 46% of Americans can't catch up. How are they going to afford to travel? That's the real challenge for 2024. And the question is, where are you going to go there where you can actually afford it? And I guess the answer is, you follow the power of the US dollar, right? Well, if you're not paying off your credit card, uh, maybe do that first. But it's certainly incredible deals in a lot of places. I mean, Japan, for instance, um, the dollar goes so much farther than it ever did Australia. Getting to Australia just once borders opened was very expensive. There weren't as many seats. You know, the, the, those were bid astronomically. Um, anywhere that Qantas flew, because if you lived in Australia, you weren't allowed not just to leave the country, but in many cases they weren't allowed to leave their state. Right? They weren't allowed to cross state borders. So there was incredible demand for a limited uh, set of resources. That won't be sustained. Um, airlines have built back their capacity. They've built back uh, the number of people that they're employing. They have uh, the pilots and the agents. American, as you said, is even laying off some of them. They feel like they have the staff. Um, so the, the capacity is largely back. We may not have all of the planes delivered that we thought we were going to, and um, there are planes that were retired, planes not being delivered because of problems at Boeing, but not just Boeing. Airbus has its own uh, challenges as well with the XLR that's behind schedule. Um, so there are, there are constraints on capacity, but it's not going to be as expensive uh, as, it, as it was. And, and if you follow the US dollar, South Africa, Turkey, Argentina are three choices I would give you right now where you are the king with the US dollar. I mean, I, every time I go somewhere, before I ever get to a hotel, because I do not like mini bars, I always stop at a grocery store on the way in and I buy what I want, right? And then I go to the hotel and ask them to take the mini bar out and put a small refrigerator in. Because you know, if you look at that $9 stickers bar long enough, you're gonna eat it and then you're gonna hate yourself. Well, when I was in Turkey last, my wife and I went to the grocery store to get stuff we wanted for the room, right? We we're gonna be there a week. So let me tell you what we bought. We bought five pounds of pistachios, five pounds of olives, we did the simit, everybody knows the beautiful simit bread. We did chocolate, we did fruit, melons, we did cookies, we got the sesame peanut, uh, peanuts. We went nuts, we filled up two shopping carts. She had to have her Coke Zero. Of course, I had to cheat with my orange Fanta. There you go, what was the bill? Two shopping carts. Anybody wanna guess? $15. Now, Countries can adjust their hotel room rates and they can adjust their airline fares, but they can't adjust basic goods and services that the locals pay, right? A tube of toothpaste is a tube of toothpaste. A cab ride's a cab ride. A dinner is a dinner. So if you're looking for great bargains. The, the New York City subway now costs $2.90. I was just in Buenos Aires. The subway costs 10 cents and it goes lots of places. 29, 129th the cost of a New York City subway ride. Right. And if you take a, ta a taxi to the airport in Buenos Aires. Yeah, like I think I paid maybe four or five dollars to get to the, an Uber to the airport. Right, a taxi from my apartment in New York to JFK with tolls is $100 now. Yeah. So 
everything being relative, follow the power of the U.S. dollar as you're trying to plan your trip for this year and going into the fall. But then we got to talk about airfares. As, as Gary was just talking about, there are new airlines coming in, and anytime you have a new airline coming in, it's sort of like the old days of the Southwest effect, average airfares tend to go down. So we have North Atlantic now, Airfare from, from Los Angeles to London now, remember I said $2,100 last year on North Atlantic? Anyone want to guess what it is right now? It's 607. That ain't bad. There's another airline called Condor, which goes through Frankfurt and has a great route system now. And they're, and they're flying brand new A330 Neos. Very nice business class, actually. Yeah. Very super, their new product, is, they, their, their old product used to be a so, little bit lacking. Yeah. Right? Absolutely. Not, not true anymore. Not so, sure I mean, anymore. there are new airlines out there that you can find. You're seeing airfare sales starting to pop up right now. Very quick pop-ups on the internet. They're not around for a while, but they're good through the end of May. We're talking airlines like Breeze. Has anybody flown Breeze? Okay, well, they fly out here. Uh, they do non-stop service between underserved cities. They actually have a non-stop service right now between Providence, Rhode Island, and Los Angeles, right? Uh, I mean, they, they'll go from Myrtle Beach to Grand Rapids. Now, they're going to you know, wow. nonstop. And if you, have to be, if you have to go from Myrtle Beach to Grand Rapids, you, don't know, you no longer have to go through Atlanta, Chicago, or Dallas. You save the day because the actual flight is not that long. So you have options, and you have fare categories now that you can do, with the exception of the blackout periods of, you know, Memorial Day or July 4th or Thanksgiving or Christmas. Other than that, it's wide open, especially in the domestic market. International airfare sales this year, or I should say prices, are expected to go up about 10%. I don't think it'll be sustained, but that's the expectation. Domestic fares are trying to drop this year between 14 and 19%. So it may be time to rediscover America. But avoid those peak periods, right? If you have to travel on a specific day, at a specific time, when everyone else does, you're a price taker, right? But if you have flexibility, and can travel at non-peak periods, that's when you're going to find the best deals. It's going, when you're going to find the mileage awards. It, it's the seats that are going to go empty if you don't uh, buy them. And it's when you're going to find the best deals at hotels. Now, look, I realize that people like to go to Europe in the summer. I kind of like to go in the winter. I mean, it's cold at home. It's not colder there. Um, there aren't as many people around. Everything's cheaper. The restaurants are just as good. You know, my, uh, I have a five-year-old daughter, and her Christmas vacation this year went until the 9th of January. It was like three-week vacation, and we're going crazy, right? I got to get out of here. We got to do something else. So we, uh, I live in Austin, and there's an Austin Amsterdam nonstop. I was able to grab three business class award tickets on my preferred travel dates, right, nonstop. We went to Amsterdam, and they have, you know, and Amsterdam, by the way, is really good for other things, okay? Um, it, they have great children's museums and playgrounds. There's no better brunch city in the world. And so we just camped out there for six nights. Yeah, I'm, and, I'm a huge fan of the off-season. Off, you know how the off-season started? Anyone want to guess? The off-season started with a, a couple of escaped garmentos in New York who were freezing their you-know-what's off in February, saying, let's go to the Caribbean. And next thing you know, that was the off-season and the on-season. Right now, look, nobody goes to Paris for a suntan anyway, so why not go in November or December? You know, I've gone to Alaska in February, and I've gone to Palm Springs in August, and I had a great time. You just have to figure out what you're going to do. And the prices, and the, uh, look, who wants to stand in line? Do we really have a culture of Americans whose only goal in life is to find a line so they can stand in it? No, that's the British, <laughs> right? And the French. And the French, but it shouldn't be you. Be a contrarian traveler. The off season is your friend on so many different levels. Obviously, if you want to go get a suntan, you can do that, but the point is you'll pay for it if you go in season. Who's got questions, by the way? Anybody have questions? Right over there? Is this on? We're going to turn the mic on. Yeah. The, the airlines charge to use the telephone to make a phone call, the surcharge to book a flight, right? Okay, let me, let me explain. I know that question gets asked a lot. <clears throat> if I call the airline to make a reservation and I don't do it online, they'll charge me $25. But here's the difference. What that airline person is seeing on their computer screen is inventory that you're not seeing on yours. 
and they're seeing routings that you're not seeing on yours. So if I could, I'll give you an example. I wanted to go from LA to Honolulu. Every airline in the world flies it, right? Alaska flies it, United, American, Delta, Southwest now, everybody, Hawaiian flies it. And they're all expensive tickets because it's all honeymoon couples, right? I'm the only guy there not on the plane saying I love you. Okay, so it was $800. It's $800 online. I called the airline, and you know what she said to me? I have a better way to take it. You know how I went to, uh, uh, to Hawaii? I went LA, Las Vegas, Hawaii. And I could have gone to LA, Phoenix, Hawaii. My fare was 440. Yeah. Did they charge you 25 bucks? Yeah, did I save 300 bucks? Yeah, math exercise over. But my, my question oh. is, sorry, my, my question is, it, is not about that surcharge, it's that they're, they're driving uh, customers to the web to purchase, and if you're buying hotel and maybe rent a car, there's an incentive to go to Expedia, you get it in one place. What are the pros and cons of, uh, in terms of cancellations, changeability, of, of making a purchase through Expedia rather than through the, the, the vendor, the, their own um, website? I think it is useful to go to an online travel agency for research to be able to compare options. You may not know whether you want to fly United or fly American or stay at Hilton or stay at Marriott. The problem is that when it comes to, and, and everything, and if for the most part, um, travel arrangements are going to be fine, um, two issues come up. And, and, and there are reasons why you'll want to book an airfare sometimes on Expedia. If you're trying to combine different airlines into a ticket that aren't going to come up on the airline website, there's reasons to do it. But number one, if something goes wrong in your trip, you're going to have to call Expedia. You're going to wait on hold for an agent who may not be well trained or very empowered, and they may not be able to solve your problem the way that the airline will be able to solve your problem. You can often, though, call the airline and, and you may have to pay them a fee to get them to take over the reservation to be able to solve it directly. The other thing is that hotels, you're usually not going to save money. Uh, you, they, there may be price parity, although the hotel chains will argue that they'll beat the price by a percent or two when you join their, free, their um, hotel loyalty program. But the Expedias of the world aren't going to show you AAA rates or you know, AARP rates uh, or any other discounts either. So you're often not going to pay less, right? And you're going to get service that I find as bad as airline service can be and as long as airline telephone hold times can be, I find that the online travel agency service is worse whenever anything goes wrong. So there, there's also one other item. For those of you who have booked online, you know about what I'm going to tell you. You can't complete the transaction unless you either opt in or opt out of the insurance. And you have no idea what you're covered for, and you have no idea what you're not covered for. You never buy the insurance online. You need to call a travel agent or the insurance company directly so somebody can walk, the, walk you through the hieroglyphics of what's in that policy or you're buying worthless coverage. But once again, we live in a world of where people just want to do it at 2 o'clock in the morning on their, on, online where they don't have to talk to anybody, they're in their bathrobe, they hit all the keystrokes and think they've won the lottery. No, you need to have a conversation because the internet can't answer those questions. Uh, I, I just wanted to second the, the idea of not booking through Expedia if you can help it in booking directly. My column, for those of you, I'm sure you all read it all the time, but in case you don't, people send me emails and they complain about something that happened to them on their trip. The absolute number one biggest, most complained about thing is, I bought my airline ticket from one company, I flew on another company and something went wrong and I'm going crazy. Uh, they're making me call Expedia or they're making me 